I'm David Axelrod, a member of the Cure Epilepsy family, and this is the 100th episode of Seizing Life. So we're going to do something a little different today. We're going to turn the microphone around on Kelly and talk to her about the lessons she's learned as host of this podcast, as an advocate in the epilepsy community, and about the important mission of Cure Epilepsy. Kelly, it's, it's great to see you. Congratulations on this milestone. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us today. Well, it's always a pleasure because you're such a good and old friend. And I actually remember exactly when you came into our lives. Uh, my wife, Susan, the founder of Cure, uh, got a call. Uh, you were across the street in the hospital, but you knew about Cure Epilepsy long before you entered the epilepsy world. Yeah, that's true. I, in like two lifetimes ago, worked at a restaurant where Cure was reaching out to host a New York City benefit. And I knew nothing about epilepsy. I knew nothing about Cure, but these people were really nice. They were from Chicago. I was like, all right, let's... We're all nice in right? Chicago. Aren't you Midwest nice? Yes. It's, like, it's a real thing. Yeah. Um, I was like, okay, let's make this happen for them. And what I didn't realize is that two years later, I would have a daughter who was diagnosed with epilepsy the exact same week that my family found out we were moving to Chicago. And it was actually a fellow coworker of mine who was like, wait a minute, do you remember that organization? I think they were out of Chicago. They dealt with epilepsy. Maybe you should reach out to them and see if they can't help you. And um, so I, I sort of feel like my family's connection to Cure is, you know, kismet. It's just meant to be. Well, I remember this because Susan um, told me about going to see you and Adelaide in the hospital and how she walked around the block several times to steal herself for this conversation because she knew what a difficult road uh, was out in front of you and she knew more than you knew at that time. And it strikes me that you are now her. Uh, and you, on this podcast and, and elsewhere, you're talking to parents who are just starting uh, this journey. How have you made that adjustment? How is that role for you? Well, first of all, if I could even dream to fill Susan's shoes, that would be an epic achievement. But, um, you know, it is, it's a, it's a crazy turn. I'll never forget that visit with Susan in the hospital and she just sharing her wisdom and listening to me. And, you know, that's when I, I fully understood the kind of family that Cure Epilepsy could provide for me. And that is always what I hope to give to other families who are walking into this club. As you actually said to my husband, Miguel, one of the first times that you met him, you said, welcome to this club. I'm so sorry that you're a member, but we're so glad that you're here. And I'll never forget that either. It is, it's this club that you don't want to be a part of, but we don't have a choice in that. So let's welcome you, let's give you a hug, and let's do everything we can to make sure that you're as, as loved and at peace and prepared as you possibly can be because it's, epilepsy's a, it's a beast. It is a beast, but you've taken this another step because through this podcast, you're reaching not just one parent at a time, but many parents and others who are impacted by epilepsy uh, at a time. W what did you hope to achieve when you started this podcast uh, you know, years ago now? Yeah, when the marketing team came to me and said, okay, we have this grant and it is to go toward awareness and we want to create a podcast, will you be the host? It was a resounding yes. I was like, this sounds amazing. And you know, the goal was to raise more awareness. It was to maybe lift Cure's profile, but it was also to be an educational tool, to be a resource for those families, and maybe even to reach beyond the epilepsy fold a little bit. Maybe we could find some topics that might interest people outside of the community, that might draw them in, that might help widen that net so that, you know, I, it's an interesting thing. We, we spoke with uh, Miles Levine a few weeks ago on an episode, and he talked to us about um, so much of the epilepsy community is we're singing to the choir, right? Preaching to the choir. And um, the trick is to get outside of yes. that. 
And, yes. and the, I think one of the hopes is, yes, we can be a source of empathy. We can be a source of education for people within the community, but maybe we can also pique some interest from people outside of it too. Because epilepsy is so misunderstood by people who haven't dealt with it, um, the pervasiveness of it, you know, three million Americans grapple with it. The fact that a third of them are have intractable epilepsy, cases of epilepsy that can't be uh, easily controlled, and the impact that has on, on people's lives, and yet um, it doesn't get the attention uh, that it that it deserves. And I, I think that that is largely because it affects so many people so differently. You know, there isn't like, there isn't one situation. I mean, even both of us have daughters who are affected by it, but Adelaide was affected in a much different way than Lauren was. And, you know, it was still incredibly impactful on their lives, but that's entirely different from someone who is still able to have a professional life, to have a family. You know, for them, it's more of this invisible illness. And so there's just, it's such a wide ranging, experience for all of those that are affected and it's really difficult to communicate that but I think through this podcast that's something that we've tried to do is show this wide variety of ways that it does affect people. How, how has this podcast affected you? Uh, you know you um, we lived through uh, this with you uh, the beautiful Adelaide uh, from the almost the beginning to the end um, how, how is this, is it hard to talk about epilepsy? Is it, uh, is it uh, cathartic to be with others who understand? Um, tell me how you think about that and how you feel about it. It is incredibly cathartic. I, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to a friend last night whose daughter has epilepsy and I was asking her how her daughter was doing. And she was like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Is this hard for you to talk about this? And I was like, no, this gives me life. This is, this is my purpose. And, and in some ways, you know, over the course of Adelaide's life, I, I, you bring in all of this knowledge. I know so much about the brain and seizures and all of these terms. And then after she died, they're just sort of like swimming around in my brain, not tethered to anything, but being able to use that knowledge to direct it somewhere, be it through a conversation with a friend or a patient or through the podcast, it, it gives me a sense of focus. It gives me a sense of purpose. And um, I'm grateful for this community every day. My daughter may not be here anymore, but I will forever be an epilepsy parent and caregiver. How do you balance your story with uh, the need to give people hope? Yeah, that's a, that is a tough one. Um, and I'll have parents who are newly diagnosed, uh, their child's newly diagnosed with infantile spasms reach out to me and I'm like, we are the worst case scenario. This is not how it always turns out. And um, it's hard, but what I can show them is that even in that worst case scenario, that I still have hope for the community as a whole, that I am still fighting, that there are organizations like Cure Epilepsy who decades into this are not going to give up. And that, that I think is the hope, is that really, really crappy things can come of epilepsy. And we can't deny that, and to deny it is a disservice to us all. But there is hope to be had through research. Yeah. And, and that, I think it's, it's redirecting the focus. You say there are organizations like Cure Epilepsy, but I'd argue that there aren't, that Cure Epilepsy is unique uh, because of the uh, focus on research and the unwillingness to accept the status quo. And there is hope in that. Hi, this is Brandon from Cure Epilepsy. Since 1998, Cure Epilepsy has raised over $85 million to fund more than 270 epilepsy research projects in 17 countries. Learn what you can do to support epilepsy research by going to cureepilepsy.org. Now back to Seizing Life. Tell me, now, now you are a past master on all of this stuff. 
uh, tell me what you've learned that um, th that gives you hope uh, about the research that's going on and some of the work that Cure uh, Epilepsy is doing. Oh my goodness, I feel like we are at such an exciting moment in epilepsy research where you know, there is some incredible studies that CURE has been in part of initiatives like the Infantile Spasms mm -hmm. Initiative, for example. So just as I was coming into CURE, they were wrapping that initiative up. And I feel like so much of science is this like push, 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 and then you have to wait forever. <laughs> and it can be really frustrating, but we are now seeing some of the results that came out of that study. Those scientists are getting these larger NIH grants and mm -hmm. they are making real progress. It is not out of, you know, the foreseeable future that we could have a new treatment for infantile spasms. Yeah. And how freaking exciting is that? We haven't had a new treatment for IS in, in years, decades even. And now we could potentially, because of science that Cure Epilepsy initiated. Yeah. And what was unique about that, that particular initiative was it brought scientists from many different disciplines together who often are in their silo uh, and it brought them together to share ideas and approaches, which is really an innovative approach, uh, innovative approach to research. Well, if, if those advances come, uh, what a tribute to Adelaide because your efforts will have made a big difference. Um, so. That I think about that all the time about our daughter Lauren and Susan's work and you know the best thing we can do to honor her is to spare others from what she's been through which leads me to the question about the podcast you you've done now these hundred episodes and you must have heard some incredibly moving stories what, what were some of the most memorable exchanges that you had or people that stand out in your mind? Oh my goodness. Um, I have always loved speaking to the people with epilepsy, that those yeah. stories, those human interest stories, and especially um, like I think of Channing, who is still horseback riding and still skiing and sort of, you know, finding these ingenious ways to still live their life and understanding that their epilepsy is still a disability. It still has these, puts these restrictions on their life, but finding ways to live full lives within those restrictions has yeah. always been just, I think it's such an important message to get out there because I think whether it's parents, whether it's an adolescent, you know, a teen who's been diagnosed, you know, being able to show that, yes, this sucks. Yeah. Hands down, this is really, really crappy, but it doesn't have to ruin your life. Yeah, and it must mean something to you to talk to people who can describe their experience because Adelaide couldn't. Yeah. Uh, even Lauren really can't articulate um, the experience of having epilepsy. So, yeah, I can see where that would be um, really meaningful to you. You know, you mentioned earlier um, the, uh, the fact that Cure Epilepsy provides grants, uh, often to scientists who uh, have very venturesome ideas about how to approach epilepsy, which is needed because the existing ideas haven't been adequate, but they can't get funding because it's not, they're not proven theories. Well, Cure Epilepsy provides the grants to allow them to prove their theories and go on to get grants from the, the uh, National Institutes of Health and other funders. Yeah, it is one of the things I am most proud of CURE for doing. It is these young researchers, these researchers who are early in their career, they have these big ideas, these you know, really interesting, but not proven ideas. And CURE always makes sure that the science is sound. Like the, the, it is a very rigorous process for our grant reviews. And in fact, there are other organizations out there who look to CURE to model their grant review process off of ours. And we sort of act as a mentor in that way. So it is not as if you know we're just throwing money out there to whatever harebrained idea comes across. Yeah. It has to be founded in, in legitimate you know, um, scientific back, 
research, but it is these ideas. We need those big ideas. We need like, I don't know how many, you know, families have heard like the horse and the zebra comparison, you know, where a doctor is like, you know, don't look for the zebras, look for the horse when they're talking about a diagnosis. But when you're dealing with something as wild as epilepsy, you have to look for those wild zebras and the research has to be in those wild zebras. It has to be in these outs, these outside the box thinking. And that is what Cure is funding. And if we don't fund it, no one else is. Yeah. And that is, it's a, it's a huge responsibility, but then we do something, you fund something and it catches on and there's this promise of something else there and then it takes off. And it is the Cure Epilepsy seed money that is propelling this larger research. And it doesn't happen if we're not here. It's funny that you should mention zebras because one of the Cure grantees earlier Cure grantees actually use zebra fish yeah. <laughs> because they had a particular neurological system that was uh, good for this kind of experimentation to rapidly test the efficacy of of epilepsy medications. Mm -hmm. That was a that was a Cure grant. Speaking of these researchers, um, we came through a very difficult period, and your podcast has as well uh, because of the virus and COVID. Um, I want to ask you in a second how you navigated that uh, during, uh, you know, with the podcast. But uh, these re a lot of these labs, Cure funds labs around the world. Uh, many of them had to close down uh, because of COVID, and uh, some of the experiments were spoiled uh, by that. Uh, and and Cure played a role in keeping many of these researchers and many of these labs alive. Yeah, COVID had a, a real serious threat to set epilepsy research back years uh, because these animal models were going to be lost because people, you know, because of, of proper COVID restrictions, um, people weren't able to get into their labs and it, uh, in, some ways money could be a band-aid there and Cure was able to step in and provide the opportunity for grants to just help keep the lights on in some of these labs, even when the institutions, because it was necessary, had to make these restrictions because of COVID and, and Cure was able to help bridge that gap and, and hopefully a lot of research wasn't lost because we could step in and help. And that's kind of a really cool thing about Cure Epilepsy because we are, we're not this monstrous organization. We can be nimble and we can yeah. think on our feet. And if there is a need in the community, we can kind of jump in and, and help. Yeah, and I, and I think another element of this is that uh, Cure Epilepsy has not only kept labs running, but it's kept young, very gifted researchers in the field. And I know that's a focus to uh, provide funding for some of these young, brilliant researchers who could be doing any number of other things, want to work on epilepsy, but weren't able to find funding to do it uh, before Cure Epilepsy came along. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. If, if they can't find funding, then they're going to go somewhere else. And so you have to give them the money to keep going, to keep their labs open and, and cures there to help those young researchers and to keep them invested in the disease. And it's, it's incredibly important. They, they need money to run their labs and, and we can provide that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do want to ask you about this uh, podcast and COVID because part of what makes this such a compelling podcast is the intimacy between you and the people you're talking to, uh, how have you, how, how did you uh, function uh, and how did you create that kind of connection uh, when you couldn't be in the same room with people? Yeah, we, when we started the podcast, it was all done in Chicago in our board member's kitchen. Um, and that was great. I, I miss that. This is so amazing to have you in front of me and to have that connection. But, you know, I think we all sort of, uh, transition to this sort of, you know, Zoom life, um, and and it's it's having those small conversations before the cameras start rolling. It is, you know, learning about someone and making those efforts, and and 
you know, I, technology is incredible and I'm, and in some ways I think the force to go entirely digital with our interviews has also opened the doors. Now we don't have to have someone in Chicago. I can talk to someone halfway across the world or in Texas or in California. And I now no longer live in Chicago. I'm in New Jersey. And so we it, regret that, but yeah, yeah, no, me too. Some days, <laughs> um, but it's, it's opened the doors and I get to talk to so many more people and share their stories and, and talk to the researchers themselves in ways that we wouldn't have before. So yes, I do miss that intimacy, but I am so grateful for this push because now I've gotten to connect with and share the journeys of so many more people. Now, you, you're, you wear many hats. You're not just the uh, host of this wonderful podcast, but you're the chair of the board. Uh, now and I want to. I just I want to talk to you about one element of uh, of cure epilepsy that I think also makes it really uh, distinctive, um, maybe not unique, but certainly distinctive. And that is, this isn't just a foundation. Uh, this is a movement uh, that that started. Are you quoting Hamilton on me? Uh, <laughs> geez, maybe I am. <laughs> I, I will be singing and dancing before the end of this uh, before the end of this podcast. Um, but the fact that you, as someone who lost a child to epilepsy, uh, and all, so many others who are involved are people who have uh, suffered the pain uh, uh, that and the devastation that, that epilepsy uh, can create. I think um, adds a, a, a sense of mission that is um, so powerful. I, I, I would say the thing I learned uh, most from this experience is that there's nothing more powerful than a love of a mother. No, there isn't. Um, I never, ever want anyone to have to go through what my family and what my daughter did. Um, but it's, it, it is, it's happening every day. There are families being diagnosed there. Are, you know, I, I'm, um, active on social media and I connect with families and I, and I watch their children and some of them pass away. And this is, this, it's, I don't believe that things happen for a reason because I, I cannot, I, I cannot figure that out how, how, what happened to Adelaide could have ever happened for a reason. However, I can make it mean something after the fact. And that is what Cure Epilepsy has provided me. Like, yes, I am the board chair. Yes, I host this podcast. Yes, we do fundraising, whatever we can. But anything that I have given to this organization is paltry compared to what the organization has given me and given my family in terms of purpose and drive and fulfillment and 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 it's that it's that give and take it's the community that i got from the moment we yeah. stepped foot in chicago it is that community that carried me through adelaide's illness and has lifted us up even after her death i i, I don't have the words and i'm usually pretty good with words for what this organization has meant to well me. uh, you, that sense of community is something that we all cherish, all of us who have suffered through uh, and watched our children in pain. But um, you are good with words, and uh, there are people who need to hear these stories beyond the epilepsy community, people in positions of power, people who have the ability to fund the kind of research on a large scale that's necessary. And so these testimonials from people like you are, uh, are really, really important and meaningful. And I think Cure Epilepsy has changed the dialogue, uh, you know, and the, the discussion in the scientific community and the policy community about the urgency of epilepsy research. Oh, there's no question about it. I mean, before Susan founded Cure Epilepsy, no one was talking about curing the disease. No one thought that that was possible. It wasn't even on the table. And Susan comes in and says, excuse me, excuse me. No, the treatment is not good enough. We need more research. We need to find a cure. There has to be a cure. And she completely changed 
the way we communicate about this. You know, there has been, prior to Cure Epilepsy coming in, SUDEP wasn't a conversation. It was sort of hidden in the shadows. No one wanted to acknowledge that it existed. There certainly wasn't research specifically looking at SUDEP. And Explain what SUDEP is. The sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. So, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't talked about. And then Cure comes in, funds some research, and now you see it as a platform in multiple epilepsy organizations. There is significant more research. There has been fun, you know, larger grant funding research in the SUDEP space. And it was CURE that raised that. It's CURE's ability to sort of shine this spotlight on a specific part of the disease state and then have that lifted up by the community and and People pay attention yeah. in, in this epilepsy space. When Cure focuses on something, everyone looks to see what we're focusing on. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But I do think it's, uh, it, it is the passion of people for whom this is a personal mission, a personal cause that has helped make that so. You know, other disease groups uh, have benefited from uh, high profile celebrities who. Uh, stand up and identify themselves with a cause. I mean, the Michael J. Fox Foundation is the, is, is the most uh, obvious example of that, but there are many others. Epilepsy really hasn't had that. We were blessed uh, by uh, Miguel's presence here when he was uh, in the uh, production of Hamilton here, and he was quite the local uh, celebrity and obviously an incredibly gifted uh, performer, and his his participation helped uh, lift us up. But how, you know, I guess it's because of the stigma that we have to defeat, that epilepsy is somehow some sort of character deficiency or whatever it is. Um, how, do, how do we attract more uh, prominent people to this cause to help lift it up further? Yeah, and how do we get more of them here prior to something tragic happening. Like I, I think of the amazing work that the Cameron Boyce Foundation yes. has done. And you know, Libby and Victor Boyce have done an amazing job, but Cameron it is Cameron passed away from uh, SUDEP yeah. um, just uh, a few months before Adelaide passed away. And you know, it is, it is unbelievably tragic that it, it took his death for that to, you know, so it's, I hope that we can come to a place through advocacy, through people sharing their stories. And you know, Miguel has a platform. You, sir, have quite the platform. Um, you know, it does, it takes, it, it takes these people with these larger platforms to share their experiences, but I, it doesn't have to be the celebrity. It can be the everyday person. Well, we've seen that. Who is open and willing to, and ta to talk about yes. it, to, to not hide it. And whether it's sharing it on social media, being comfortable to share it in their social circle, but we have to support them and give them the information and uh, so that they do feel confident and comfortable. And it, yes, we can rely on the people at the top of the platforms, but I think that this is a grassroots effort and it really has to start with the people who are affected every day. Hence, seizing life, which is a part of that effort. And uh, I get, you're taking to the written word as, as well. You're writing a book and that will be another uh, important lever to get people to focus on this issue. Yeah, so Normal Broken um, will come out a um, little ways away, November of 2023. So I'm in the final stages of writing it due to my publisher soon, but it is, um, it's about grief and the grief journey. And um, my grief journey of you know, losing my daughter started long before we said goodbye to her physical yeah. body. Epilepsy can force you to grieve some normalcy and these typical life moments that you just sort of expect. Yes. And, and so I, I was grieving her long before. In fact, I remember, you know, it was probably a couple days before she died and I turned to my mother and I asked her, you know, do you think all of this time that I've been grieving, can that, will that count as like time served toward like my future grief sentence? And she was like, yeah, Kelly, I don't think it works that yeah. way. Yeah. And it doesn't, but, um, 
but I'm hoping that this book can be a companion of sorts to meet people wherever they are in the grief process because it is not linear. It is a deranged chicken Well, dance. and in fact, the darkest place for a parent who has a child who is going through really severe epilepsy uh, is the what might have been place, mm -hmm. the, the, the dreams that never will be yeah. place. And that's you try and avoid it uh, at all costs and be grateful for every good minute and every good day that you can find. But it's hard not to, I call it being lost in the hads, yes. you know, lost in what you had, in, in the dreams that you had for your child or for yourself, yeah. if, you know, if it's affecting you personally. And um, it does, Gr grief came into my life with epilepsy and it has not left and it never will. Um, but I, I do, I hope that this book can help people whether they are grieving a, an idealized life, whether they are grieving the loss of a spouse or a parent or a child, um, and just sort of be that friend that they need. Well, I can tell you that we have, uh, we have returns that uh, tell me that you sharing your stories and exploring other people's stories here on this podcast has had an impact on people's lives. And we asked people to sign this, uh, a, a digital card for you. Shut uh, the so, front door. So, so, I never heard that. That must be, <laughs> that's, that's gotta be an Omaha, an Omaha expression. But uh, we say it differently in New York, uh, but that's where I grew up. But um, uh, among the comments that people sent were these, Kelly has brought so much visibility to epilepsy and to cure epilepsy. She took a horrible situation and used it as a gift to help others. Uh, your generosity, curiosity, and warmth ensure that important information about epilepsy is shared broadly throughout the community. Thank you for your tremendous commitment to ensure that the important stories are told. You gave us the courage to become advocates when we felt so defeated by epilepsy and, uh, and infantile spasms. You are bringing awareness and education to the world. And then finally, here's an, uh, another one, although this is just a sampling. In you, the epilepsy community has found a formidable and tireless warrior who continues to educate, advocate, and inspire. Thanks for all you do. I only wish that that was my offering because that's exactly how I feel about you. And um, just as we wrap up, um, I, uh, I, I was lucky enough to know Adelaide, and um, I think she would be very proud of what you're doing. Thank you so much. I, I, that means so much to me, and it's, um, it means so much to hear that, you know, that the podcast or the, the work, the advocacy, that it is, it is touching people and it is reaching people. Um, but I may be the face on this podcast or the voice, but I, this is, this is not my production in any way, shape or form. There are all of these people standing around us right now who are the true drivers of this, who are out there doing, finding the topics and interviewing the people and sending me the notes so that I can look good and polished. And like, I, I know what I'm talking about, but they're the ones who are doing all of the work and, and editing it together and then getting all the social. I mean, like, and unplugging is, the refrigerator. So unplugging the refrigerator noise, yeah. so it doesn't make noise. I mean, the, this, I, I have, I have so much admiration for Cures Marcom team, specifically John Boston and Debbie Hecht. I, this, this podcast would not exist without them. I, yeah. I am the face. I am the voice. And that is where my contribution to this ends. They, they are truly the players. That well, make this we are happen. grateful to all of you, and I hope that you invite me back for the 200th Yay! anniversary. Will you please? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I can't wait. I can't oh, wait, but I... I look forward to another 100 great episodes. I love chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for joining me for the 100th episode of Seizing Life and a heartfelt thank you for all your support, and to Susan for her vision in creating Cure Epilepsy, which has led to groundbreaking research, built community, and provided hope to those living with epilepsy and their families. 
I also want to thank all the researchers, physicians, and community members who have shared their insights, expertise, and stories with us in our first 100 episodes. Hosting this podcast has expanded my knowledge of epilepsy and increased my admiration for the researchers seeking new discoveries and the doctors treating those with epilepsy. It has also deepened my feeling for this community, strengthened my resolve to advocate for epilepsy awareness, and inspired me to push for more research funding so that one day we will have a cure for epilepsy. If you would like to support our mission to find a cure, please visit cureepilepsy.org forward slash donate. Through research, there is hope. Thank you. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Cure Epilepsy. The information contained herein is provided for general information only and does not offer medical advice or recommendations. Individuals should not rely on this information as a substitute for consultations with qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with individual medical conditions and needs. Cure Epilepsy strongly recommends that care and treatment decisions related to epilepsy and any other medical conditions be made in consultation with a patient's physician or other qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with the individual's specific health situation.